let's pick one of those examples, a cheek swab or a, a, a blood test. You're, and you're going to do this enormous depth of readout to really make sure that there are no copies of the BRCA gene or any of the other genes that you're looking at. How many genes, by the way, when we do uh, a breast cancer genetic screen, how many known genes are we looking for? So interestingly, uh, it's a little bit of a la carte. So what I mean by that is it's the, your choice. It's your choice either as a doctor ordering the test. It's your choice as a patient that's getting the test. In some cases, you know you have a family history of a BRCA mutation. And so within that case, we may know the exact address to go to. And it's a very simple plus minus readout. And we don't have to do a whole genome sequence for that. Mm -hmm. We just need to look at one gene and say yay or nay. It's there or not there for that particular variant. Um, Beyond that, there are even, I alluded to this before, but there are certain uh, variants that are seen in certain communities. So as an example, if you happen to be Ashkenazi Jewish, there are three different spots in BRCA1 or 2 that account for the vast majority of all mutations in those two genes. And if you know that, we can take a shortcut and we can basically say for literally a small fraction of the cost of sequencing a genome, boop, 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 we look at those three spots, we get yay or nay, and you've got most of the information that you need. Um, to your point, uh, there are some people who come in with a family history of breast cancer and they say, but I want to be careful. And so in that circumstance, we may do a panel of 50 different genes, 50 different mm -hmm. genes that'll cover most of the genes that we see for hereditary, not just breast cancer, but ovarian cancer, colon cancer, the most common cancers that we see that are driven by germline or inherited genetic factors. So for round numbers, 50 is a good number when you're trying to be really comprehensive. If you said, just give me the focus breast cancer things, it might be more like 10. Yeah. And again, you, you've said this twice now, but I think it's it's helpful for folks to listen. When last I checked, maybe 5% of cancer was accounted for by germline mutations. 95% of cancer is accounted for by somatic mutations. Is that still accurate, would you say? I'd say I'm going to modify that just a little bit, not to be a contrarian, um, but for the genes that I'll call monogenic, highly penetrant. Let me unpack that a little bit. Yep, monogenic. Good, good, good point. Monogenic, single gene, highly penetrant, high probability that over the life course you'll develop cancer if you have this particular gene genetic variant. So when you limit yourself to that, yes, about 5% of cancers are due to those powerful single genes, high probability of cancer. Now, on the other hand, over time, we've realized that there are additional genes that I'll call moderate risk genes. Many of those genes may confer something like a two to threefold increased risk as opposed to something like a a tenfold increased risk. So there's another probably 5% or so that are due to those. And then there's this other thing that we call polygenic risk. Poly meaning multiple genetic genes, polygenic multiple genes. And the number of genes we oftentimes look at in those circumstances may be anywhere from 100 to hundreds or even in some cases thousands of genetic variants all mathematically summed together to understand what the risk is associated with that pattern. Package. All of us have genetic variants that go into that polygenic risk. And part of the question is along a distribution, are you at the high end of that risk curve or are you at the low end or at the average end? And so within that, um, this is now something that is not clinically being utilized routinely, but we are on a research point of view trying to understand clinical implementation for now those polygenic risks for cancer. And um, so, so assuming that that amounts to, I don't know, we'll figure it out, but that might amount to 10% of cases, you'd say, well, look, 20% of cancer has a genetic component as opposed to, and it's broken down into those three categories of, you know, monogenic, highly penetrant. Uh, I think the second category, was it monogenic, not highly penetrant or not monogenic? I'd call it monogenic, moderate risk. Moderate penetrant and then polygenic. Right. And those would be the three. And then going back to this case of, say, the breast cancer example, right? So a woman says, um, I just want to do a deep dive on breast cancer. I don't know which genes it is because all my family is deceased, but, you know, four women in my family have died of breast cancer. We're going to do this cheek swab and you're going to look at 10 genes that are associated plus whatever the polygenic genes are. Um, why is it that you don't need to look directly at breast cells. Why is it that we can infer that what we see 
in a cheek cell, an endothelial cell, uh, or an epithelial cell rather in the cheek, or in a monocyte in the blood is also captured in, uh, in mammary tissue? Good question. And the answer is it's probably not. Um, so what you're doing when you're doing the cheek sample, the blood sample, is you're really getting at the germline. So you're mostly getting at what you were born with, uh, what that inherited uh, susceptibility is. As we talked about, though, your genes are changing over your life course. Your cells are changing over your life course. And cancer doesn't happen overnight. You don't go from a normal cell to a cancer cell overnight. There's a progression in terms of going through this. And so uh, there are other ways that people have thought about that I'll call it a liquid biopsy. So this idea that you might be able to, and it's a slightly different test than what I was describing before, but where you would look for these somatic mutations, you described this before, but when you're looking for that needle in a haystack, if you've got a tumor that's going to slough off some of that DNA into the circulation, you might be able to see some of that fragmented DNA floating around, and you might be able to pick up some of those mutations that might be reflective of that mammary cell that's either gone awry and is a cancer, but maybe not something that you're detecting on mammography or something else. And so this is in some ways been the holy grail of being able to do cancer screening. It's not quite ready for prime time yet. Um, and people think about it more, I would say right now for thinking about recurrence of cancer. So how do you monitor someone who's had a previous cancer diagnosis? You think they're all clear and seeing whether or not they've had a recurrence. Um, the other use case people have thought about is someone who might be at high risk of cancer. So someone who's identified in whatever reason based on an exposure based on a genetic profile, but it's not ready yet for population screening in terms of being able to pick up cancers at an earlier stage. We're still relying on other things to do that. 